to Trail Talk here on LTTV. I'm Chris Ford. I'm the Director of Marketing for Illinois Eastern Community Colleges and Lincoln Trail College. And I'm joined by Dr. Zahi Atala, the President of Lincoln Trail College. Zahi, how are you today? I'm doing great, and I'm doing even better because of our conversation with Chancellor Garcia from the Colorado Community College. Yeah, I'm really excited. We're going to be sitting down today and talking with Joe Garcia, the Chancellor of the Colorado Community College System, and uh, he's someone that has had a tremendous background in higher education and education in general at a lot of different levels. In addition, yes, in addition to equity and, uh, you know, whether he was in, he told us in, in, uh, in the federal government in housing or working across multiple states in higher education or within four-year administration, a four-year institution or two-year uh, colleges. I I'm very excited. So let's take a look uh, at Joe Garcia, the Chancellor of the Colorado Community College System. All right, joining us now are our special guest on Trail Talk this week is Joe Garcia, who is the Chancellor of the Colorado Community College System. Uh, Joe, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, Zahi, I'm going to turn things over to you here to get us started. Yeah, um, thanks again for being with us. I mean, on F Wikipedia, there's a big page about you, your your background, your, you know, um, all of the great things you've done across the nation. But do you mind letting our, our uh, viewers within our uh, trail talk know a little bit more, more about you? Why are you in the world of education? That's a question people often ask me since as a student, I wasn't even a particularly successful or motivated student. I start out at a state university as a, came from a, as a graduate of a majority minority public high school, moved into a university where frankly I struggled. Um, but figured out eventually and turned things around and uh, then went uh, from University of Colorado uh, to Harvard Law School with an interest in equity in education because of my own experiences as a student. After I got out of law school, I worked as a lawyer for 10 years with a focus on public education law, again, because I was concerned about um, equity in public schools. Uh, I had a chance to move into state government uh, where I worked for a previous governor as a member of his cabinet, not related to education. And then I had a chance to work for a previous president as a presidential appointee um, for one of the large cabinet departments, uh, housing and urban development. But from there, I was recruited to apply for a position at Pikes Peak Community College, the second largest community college in the state of Colorado. And because, again, of my interest in equity in education, I pursued that job and served as the president of Pikes Peak Community College for five years, uh, in which a time during which I learned a great deal about things like remedial education, uh, about successful transfer, about career and technical education, as well as academic programming. But from there, I went to become the president of Colorado State University in Pueblo, a regional comprehensive university that was also an HSI. Uh, and again, focused on the challenges facing first generation and working class students of color. After that, I became Lieutenant Governor of Colorado and jointly the head of the Department of Higher Education. So for six years, I worked with all of the institutions of higher education in the state, public and private, two year and four year, from technical schools to uh, graduate programs. And uh, after that, I uh, became the president of something called WICHI, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. It's a interstate compact and it's based in Colorado, but it served all 15 Western states from Colorado westward and from Alaska to Hawaii to Guam to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And I worked on higher education policy in all those different contexts. And after that, I had the opportunity to come back and be chancellor of the community college system, where I preside over 13 colleges. We're the largest system of undergraduate education in Colorado. And we serve about 50% of all students of color 
in Colorado. That's where I am. That's what I care about. That's what I'm passionate about. So that's a great background. Um, so I want to dive right in. And this is something that in, in community colleges, we've all heard this at some point or another, that there's this stigma to community colleges. It, it's quote unquote, not real college, or it's an extension of high school. And we cringe when we hear that because we know that's not true. But what are some of the things that, that community colleges can and should be doing to fight that stigma? Well, we know that higher education is supposed to be um, the ultimate meritocracy. It's supposed to be the mechanism by which people move up economically, socially, uh, and yet we still treat community college as less than. When I became president of CSU Pueblo, a university, I had one of the faculty members tell me later after things were going well, that she had voted against me as being president of the university because I came from a community college. And she said, frankly, she would have been supportive of me if I had had absolutely no experience in higher education rather than had experience as a community college, because she thought I would turn the university, I would impact the quality, the reputation of the university. Now that didn't happen, but that is the way we're perceived. It's the sense that if you were a good enough student, you'd never attend a community college, you'd go to a university. If you were a good enough faculty member, you wouldn't start at a community college, you'd go to a university. It's you're at a community college because you couldn't go elsewhere. We know that's not true. I just heard from a student today who graduated from Pikes Peak this year. He's a military student, a veteran who came back, went to community college, and is now transferring to Princeton as an engineering student. We, we had another student at Front Range last year who was interested in math and transferred to MIT. It is not impossible. We have very capable students, and there's an assumption that our faculty members are not qualified when a surprising number of our faculty members have PhDs, EDDs, they have terminal degrees, they could teach anywhere. We're fortunate that they teach with us. So we know we create more opportunities for success and that some students who started community college start there because they have limited resources, limited financial resources, sometimes limited academic preparation, sometimes limited family support, but if we do our jobs well, they can overcome those things and do very well academically, and many, many do. So jumping into our next point, um, what do you see as the future for community colleges? Well, it's gonna be challenging for a while because as you know, we've been impacted by a decline in enrollment nationally. And unfortunately with our focus on closing equity gaps, we're beginning to see those grow wider because the students who aren't coming are the students who are lowest income and who are students of color and who are first generation. We need to focus on getting them back. But I think the future of a community college is very positive because what everybody talks about now is student debt load. And we know our students graduate with less debt because we provide more support and because our tuition is lower. The other thing people talk about is workforce readiness. Are you ready to move into a job? Well, I think we, again, prepare students more directly for moving into a job than universities and liberal arts colleges. Those are great pathways, but ours are much more focused on workforce because we work directly with employers to identify community needs. I also think there's more of a focus on adult learners because we're seeing a decline in the number of high school graduates. Illinois is a great example. For years, it's seen a decline in the number at least of white high school graduates. And we serve students of color and adult learners better than other institutions because we've always done so. We still need to do better. We do not offer courses and especially student services at a time that they're easily accessed by working adult learners, and we need to change. We also need to continue to change in the way we deliver remedial education. And primarily, we need to deliver less of it and do more co-requisite remediation so that students aren't wasting a lot of time 
uh, pay, and a lot of tuition money paying for non-credit classes, which, as we've discovered, don't really work well to move people successfully through college level classes and through completion. And we're going to be doing a lot more in hybrid and online. That's what adult learners need. And that's what students expect now. And so that kind of flexibility is going to give us, I think, a leg up on the four years because we've been doing it longer and we're more nimble. Uh, Chancellor, uh, I, I heard you talk about, you know, your thoughts on the dip in enrollment and in, in, in the approaches to change it. I know none of us has a magic wand, but you've, for, for a few decades now, you've been, from what you told us, you've been beyond an advocate, you've been a fighter for equity and, and diversity in higher education. Is, is that the, the solution to our dip in enrollment or, or will we still be floundering uh, if, if we don't have concerted strategies that you perhaps are looking at? We do need, we need to do both, but the focus on equity is going to help us. Let's look nationally at uh, high school graduation numbers. Since 2012, nationally, the number of white high school graduates has been in decline. The only areas where we've seen growth is in Asian and Latino uh, high school graduation rates. The challenge is that those populations, well, not so for Asians, but for Latino and African-American and Native American, they've been less likely to enroll in college. But when they do enroll, they're more likely to enroll at community colleges. Uh -huh. We're closer, we're more affordable, and we provide more flexibility. But we need to focus on those populations. And if we do that, I think we can be successful. The challenge is that college doesn't just cost in terms of tuition and fees, there's an opportunity cost to going to college. And right now, because students are able to get higher wages than they were a couple of years ago, many of them are saying, I do want to go to college, but right now I can make $18 an hour. This is the first time in my life we've been able to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to pay off my debts. I'm going to help out my family. I'm going to buy a car and I'll go to college later. So what we need to do is tell those students, it doesn't need to be either or. You can go to work and still take college classes and you'll be better off if you do so. So we've got to provide flexible instructional delivery so that they can do that. You talk about you talked about flexibility, you talked about uh, developmental education. You know, uh, flexibility could be in our scheduling, could be in our modality. But what about uh, competency-based education compared with the way we've been doing things? What about uh, sharing? I know in, in Colorado, there the curriculum is uniform across the various colleges, but what about sharing more to make it more universal? What are your thoughts and how do you see uh, on a system level and on a national level, a cooperation across institutions? Uh, it's together? growing. I think it's, it's growing, Zahi, but it's been as a result primarily of policymakers and legislators forcing universities to sort of play in this game with us, to allow us to transfer courses guaranteed for credit to four-year institutions. You know that that wasn't always the case and that universities have often resisted it because they felt the courses that our students were taking, the quality of the instruction was not comparable and they were requiring students to retake classes. We know that students now are more likely to, what I call swirl, attend multiple institutions at different times and try to accumulate credit to a degree. But for years, it's been difficult for them to patch all those credits together to earn a credential. We need to make sure that that is possible for students. And we need to make sure that students are getting advised appropriately so they're not taking courses that won't transfer. That's really critical. But we also need to think about how institutions make money. We're increasingly reliant on tuition, especially at the community college level, but also at the four-year level. So having students take half of their credit somewhere else hurts whatever institution, that, you know, so that's why the four years want students to transfer, but they'd rather them transfer immediately and not after 
two years or 60 credits. They want them to pay for that tuition at their institution. So we've got to create financial models that make it uh, financially rewarding for institutions to graduate students and not just make money by keeping them on the hook for more credit hours and more tuition dollars. A lot of the way our systems are financed though, creates perverse incentives. So for example, PLA, prior learning and assessment and getting credit that way. A lot of students, especially adult learners, former military, you know, people could gain a lot and graduate sooner, but there's no financial incentive for institutions to do that. They've got to spend money and time to evaluate the courses, to determine what credit should be given, and they don't get paid anything for that. Think about non-credit uh, education. We're asked to do a lot, a lot of non-credit instruction that will help people with specific workforce skills, but we don't get any state assistance, any state money for providing that. We have to do it based entirely on revenue generation through tuition alone, which means charging more than we would for traditional courses. That's again, not a way to help working adults gain more skills. So we've got to address the built-in financial disincentives to doing things like cooperating for transferability, uh, for PLA, and even for competency-based uh, education. Big challenges ahead of us. Yeah. So Chancellor, we're, we're just about uh, out of time, but uh, before we we go today, do you have any final thoughts or anything that, that you would like to add that we haven't addressed today? I would say this, that we need to recognize that all education is important, whether it's career and technical education or liberal arts, all of those things will help students who want to have more stability, more economic stability. Uh, the people who do get a post-secondary credential are the ones least likely to be impacted by uh, a recession, by a pandemic, by the range of things that we have seen in this country over the last 20 years. We know the people who have fared best are those with college credentials. So we need to continue to encourage people to go. And then we need to change the way we do things to accommodate them, not to accommodate the institution or the faculty. And that means again, more flexibility in when and how we offer not just instruction, but student support services. Well, uh, Chancellor Joe Garcia, uh, Chancellor of the Colorado Community College System, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you. It was great meeting you, and we can't thank you enough for the time you've given us and our students. Uh, I hope many more see it and learn from you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you doing this. Well, Zahi, I thought that was a great conversation uh, with Joe Garcia. That was wonderful. You know, the, the, to sum everything up, what he said is all education is important. And I'm quoting him here, you know, to remind us that, you know, yes, we divide ourselves into K through 12 and, and pre-K and, you know, 12 through 14 and, and uh, you know, uh, 13 through and 14 and, you know, 13 through 16 and whatnot. But it, it's just not really the end all, that education is a broader, bigger spectrum and, and it should be transferable. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the other important thing that, that he pointed out too is the power that education has for, for individuals getting ahead, making themselves recession-proof, making themselves yeah. uh, pandemic-proof, yes. and, and the opportunities for that that exist, especially at the community college level. Yeah, he talked about the uh, debt load. Uh, he didn't go delve into details, but we all know that the education at the community college is most typically uh, less of a burden on, on individuals and their families, and financial aid goes perhaps a little further. Uh, but he reminded us of that and putting it into a context of equity and reminding us that we are perhaps a conduit for a societal transformation, not trying to be political here, but trying to see how 
we can move our, our economy and our society further ahead. Well, we've had some wonderful guests like Joe yes. Garcia joining us on Trail Talk. If you enjoy these videos with Trail Talk, uh, be sure and like this video. Be sure and subscribe to our channel. Ring the bell down below so you get notifications when we post more new content on the Lincoln Trail College YouTube channel, whether it's Trail Talk or whether it's any of our other videos. And be sure and follow us on our other social media platforms as well. So, for Dr. Zahi Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time on Trail Talk on LTTV.